Hi, very good morning. I am Dr. Janak Patel, MD, General Physician. All my video lectures are mainly for educative purpose. In continuity with the previous lecture, today we will be dealing with one of the very interesting topic that is Parkinson disease and Parkinsonism. This will be very useful to you in your theory as well as in your oral exams. And also you will see lot number of cases in your everyday practice regarding Parkinson disease. So there are few terms, Parkinsonism, Parkinson disease. There's also one term utilized for Parkinson disease is paralytic agitants or akinetic rigid syndrome. These are the few terms which are very frequently being utilized. We will be discussing under common heading, definition, etiology, pathophysiology, clinical features, investigations, differential diagnosis, treatment and complications. These are some of the famous person who were suffering from Parkinson disease. Parkinsonism is a progressive neurological disorders of muscle movement as a clinical syndrome and it consists of a four cardinal features that is bradykinesia, muscular rigidity, resting tremors and impairment of postural imbalance. Secondary to this person will have a mask like face, siloria, Difficulty in speech, mental process will be retarded and person can have even dementia. Any person who has got any one of these four cardinal symptoms will be put into a group we call as a Parkinsonism. Parkinson disease is one of the conditions which will be having Parkinsonism. Bradykinesia can be slowness of movement to the extreme case where there is almost nearly absence of movement we call as a kinesia. Resting tremors are usually what we call as tremor will disappear during voluntary movements. And because of muscular rigidity and bradykinesia person will also have a impairment in a postural imbalance and disturbances in gait and person will have a frequent falls. These are the common four features and along with that you can get mask like face, siloria, difficulty in speech, mental process will be retarded and person can even develop dementia. So if you want to differentiate between Parkinsonism and Parkinson disease, there are few differences. Parkinsonism will have a resting tremor, bradykinesia, cogwheel rigidity, impaired postural reflexes. And Parkinson disease can be one of among the Parkinsoni Parkinsonian disorder. So Parkinson disease will be one of the condition in Parkinsonism. And one most important difference that Parkinsonism would respond to dopamine replacement therapy while Parkinson disease is Parkinsonian sim symptoms plus asymmetric onset. It usually starts unilateral and then later on it becomes bilateral. Most important part it is dopamine responsive. There is absence of saccadic problems and early severe orthostasis. There can be levy body in substantia nigra and it will respond dramatically to dopamine replacement therapy. This is the most important clue for Parkinson disease. So Parkinson's disease diagnostic criteria is hypokinetic hypertonic syndrome. Because of increased tone, there is a decreased movement we call hypokinesia. And there is an increased tone we call hypertonic. So it is called hypokinetic hypertonic syndrome. 
it always starts unilaterally and it responds wonderful to dopamine replacement therapy that is levodopa and the absence of postural instability autonomic symptoms cognitive disturbances at an early stage these three are not commonly seen in an early stage so classical symptoms we call prep t for tremor which are resting tremor which are almost present in 70% of the group of people rigidity which is a variety of a cogwheel rigidity there is either akinesia or bradykinesia and there is a postural instability hence it is also described as a slow stiff slow means akinetic stiff means rigidity and shaky means tremor so it is called slow stiff shaky and signs usually starts very frequently unilaterally and very commonly in upper arm and then spreads to the other side and entire body this is a peculiar in case of a parkinson's disease so you get tremors drooping eyelid salivary drooling head tilted forward so slow shuffling gait with short steps there are some criteria which are being described step 1 bradykinesia step 2 you have to exclude the other causes of parkinsonism now in this particular bradykinesia resting tremors hypotonia and postural instability these are the four classical features while in step 3 at least three of the following which are supportive criteria unilateral onset resting tremor progressive persistent asymmetry and excellent response to levodopa severe levodopa induced chorea can occur and that will produce dyskinesia levodopa response will be for 5 years or more and clinical course of 10 years or more these are some of the criteria which will be there and for positive supportive criteria at least there should be more than 3 for definite parkinson disease so you should have at least minimum 3 from this supportive criteria so that will tell you that it is parkinson disease you have to exclude certain things history of repeated stroke history of repeated head injury history of encephalitis cerebellar signs severe autonomic involvement supranuclear gas palsy neuroleptic drugs and negative response to large dose of levodopa these are the excluding criteria or exclusion criteria there are nits diagnostic criteria for parkinson disease where group a group b then criteria for definite criteria for probable criteria for possible at your leisure time you can go through for definite parkinson all criteria from probable should be met for criteria for probable probable parkinson disease all criteria at least 3 of four features in group a plus none of the features in group b then you put them into probable b probable parkinson and possible at least two of the four features in group a should be present at least one of the tremors or bradykinesia and among group b you should have less than 3 years duration these are called nits criteria by and large we use the common terms like parkinson parkinsonian disorders which can be divided into typical and not typical parkinson disease is divided into idiopathic and secondary parkinsonism and parkinsonism plus syndrome so these are the different terms which will be very frequently being utilized so you divide them into primary or idiopathic parkinsonism 
secondary parkinsonism and parkinsonism plus syndrome these are the common terms which are being utilized among idiopathic parkinson disease will be accounting for 80% of the people and secondary parkinsonism can be due to drug induced toxic material toxic drugs and chemicals vascular post hypoxic post encephalitic and post traumatic these are some of the common causes which will lead to parkinsonism while parkinson parkinsonism plus syndrome is progressive supranuclear palsy levy body dementia multiple system atrophy and cortico basal degeneration these are some of those groups which will fit into parkinsonism plus syndrome so you can divide into primary and secondary primary you can divide into typical and atypical atypical you have got a sporadic and familial while typical will be classical parkinson disease which can be sporadic and familial so this is the way we divide commonly and among secondary you can come across medical medic stains where commonest drug is neuroleptic drugs metabolic disorders like wilson disease endocrine disorders like hypothyroidism heavy metals like magnesium infectious disease like wipers disease normal pressure hydrocephalus vascular disease like multiple infarcts or hypoxic damage toxins like like what we call as a mptp that is methyl phenyl tetra hydropyridine which is a toxic chemical and repetitive trauma very frequently in a boxer football player etc in those group of people so these are some of the secondary groups hypokinesia most common cause is parkinsonism and other you can come across in hypothyroidism stiff person syndrome rheumatological condition orthopedic condition ankylosing spondylitis etc and then you will have to differentiate this from idiopathic parkinsonism and striato nigra degeneration groups and then there will be an another group called as a hereditary degenerative group secondary parkinsonism and parkinsons plus syndromes we are not going into detail regarding that if you are interested at your leisure time you can go through this will be the group where you will have a hereditary history and you will have a underlying systemic or neurological disease which will be very common in secondary parkinsonism while in case of a parkinson plus you will have a underlying disorders which will be involving central nervous system so this will be some of the groups which will be there so etiology we divide into three big groups that is idiopathic and secondary among idiopathic the most common condition is parkinson disease which is having genetic etiology may be familial or sporadic it is said that partly it may be because of some environmental factor that is exposure to herbicides or pesticides and because of aging process while in secondary parkinsonism drug induced toxins encephalitis repeated trauma like punch drunk syndromes vascular normal pressure hydrocephalus etc while in case of a parkinsonism plus syndrome progressive supranuclear palsy multi system atrophy diffuse levy body cortico basal degeneration those groups and among heredo degenerative parkinsonism will be spino cerebellar ataxia and wilson disease some of the risk factor which are being well established like pesticides and herbicides aging process concussion gender and among heavy metal copper manganese lead magnesium etc those are some of the compounds which can lead to damage to basal ganglia particularly to substantia nigra and can lead to parkinsonism so 85% of the time it is parkinson disease familial 
groups will be one of the group or sporadic parkinsonian syndromes will be all these groups secondary parkinsonism we have already discussed drug induced and vascular comes topmost on the list then degenerative disorders and genetic disorders we have already mentioned good number among toxins mptp magnesium carbon monoxide methanol comes quite ahead among metabolic disorders hypoparathyroidism hypothyroidism comes quite ahead vascular etiology age associated post encephalitis normal pressure hydrocephalus post traumatic and occasionally spouse occupying lesion like subdural hematoma tumors aneurysms etc and paraneoplasty so these are some of the conditions which can end up with secondary parkinsonism as far as epidemiology is concerned prevalence is 1.5 in 1000 it is more after the age of 60 sex incidence wise almost nearly equal less common in smoker exactly the mechanism is not understood so factor which decreases the incidence is smoking coffee drinking use of nsaid and estrogen replacement in post menopausal women these are some of the factors where parkinson disease is seen to be less common so it decreases the incidence in the person who are smoker coffee drinks nsaid and estrogen replacement therapy exact mechanism is still not known average age more than 60 if it is seen under the age of 40 then it is usually called young onset of parkinson disease rarely seen under the age of 30 and when it is seen below the age of 30 it is usually referred as juvenile parkinsonism so it is called childhood or adolescent parkinsonism or juvenile parkinsonism it is rare it is mainly a neurodegenerative disorders affecting dopaminergic neurons in substantia nigra so in a substantia nigra the dopaminergic neurons undergoes degeneration and there is a deficiency of dopamine and mainly among the basal ganglia substantia nigra is the most commonly structure which is being affected so movement in the body is produced by motor cortex but the main motor pathway consist of pyramidal system extra pyramidal system modulates the pyramidal system so the impulse is going from extra pyramidal system to motor cortex and then the movement takes place and among extra pyramidal system substantia nigra striatum subthalamic nucleus globus pallidus thalamus etc takes part among this the substantia nigra is the most important structure where maximum degeneration and dopamine deficiency is there so it is a big iceberg where substantia nigra is the commonest structure but you can have involvement of pons other basal ganglia hypothalamus you can have spinal cord involvement you can have neocortex temporal cortex olfactory cortex olfactory bulbs etc so sometime you even get disturbances in smell and other function of cerebral cortex also so basal ganglia is responsible for control of voluntary movement control of muscle tone control of muscular activity and automatic associated movements hence we get disturbances in voluntary movement disturbances in muscular tone and disturbances in muscular activity these are the common thing which we usually see so parkinson disease is because of environmental factor or aging factor or genetic factor where it will result into oxidative stress excitotoxicity there is a lack of protective mechanism and there is a mitochondrial damage which will result into apoptosis and there will be damage to 
substantia nigra cells loss of dopamine and loss of other cells will be due to loss of other neurotransmitter substance also apart from dopamine so dopamine dopamine deficiency and damage to the cells which are dependent on dopamine like substantia nigra hence you will get three classical symptoms that is tremor rigidity and because of rigidity bradykinesia and other symptoms are because of the damage to the other structures where dementia sleep disturbance says mood changes like depressions all those things so genetic conditions and environmental conditions environmental conditions will produce damage to the mitochondria because of toxins like mptp and other material which will produce oxidative stress or excitotoxicity and you will have a calcium dysregulation and because of calcium dysregulation you will get neuronal dysfunction and cell death while genetic conditions because of a mutation in all these different types of genes there is altered protein conformation abnormal aggregation defective processing and that will give rise to neuronal dysfunction and secondary to neuronal dysfunction there is a inflammation and there is a cell death apoptosis this will give rise to decrease in dopaminergic neurons so frontal cortex stimulates by glutamate to striatum and substantia nigra produces dopamine which will stimulate d2 and d1 which will have external segments and internal segments stimulation and finally it will give an input via thalamus to frontal cortex and frontal cortex will be acting on brain stem and spinal cord producing smooth movements but because of a damage to substantia nigra there is a decreased production of dopamine and this particular stimulus is affected function of subthalamic nucleus globus pallidus substantia nigra as well as striatum is being affected hence you will get symptom signs of increased tone increased tone will increase the rigidity that will result into bradykinesia and involuntary movement in the form of resting tremors so genetic factors environmental factors and endogenous toxins will produce oxidative stress protein aggregation mitochondrial damage inflammation and apoptosis and finally ends into parkinson disease so neurodegeneration of substantia nigra dopamine loss and that will be ending into parkinson disease so you can see that here there is decrease in the dopaminergic neuronal cells in substantia nigra leading to parkinson disease so the balance between acetylcholine and dopamine is reduced dopamine level is reduced acetylcholine level rises and that will give rise to classical parkinson disease and after treatment you have to balance back so that the dopamine comes up and acetylcholine level becomes equal to dopamine that will be the treatment part in a case of parkinsonism this is little complicated diagram i am not going into detail that how exactly you get basal ganglia affected and that produces involuntary movements rigidity etc at your leisure time you can go through this is in the disease side lack of dopamine so basal ganglia are functions are affected acetylcholine will inhibit and that will give rise to involuntary movement because the input to the motor cortex is not given properly reticular formation will be working that will be increasing the muscle tone and tremors and that will give rise to the classical all the four signs that is resting tremors rigidity cogwheel rigidity 
bradykinesia or alkinesia and because of all those postural instability so among clinical features we have already mentioned tremors rigidity bradykinesia and loss of postural tremor are the classical features in that two are more added flex posture and freezing phenomena but these four are the classical we call trap t r a alkinesia and posture so tremor rigidity and bradykinesia are the classical and when it is levodopa responsive we put them into what we call as parkinson disease and by and large it is asymmetric there is also postural instability and as the time passes levodopa becomes unresponsive and there is other associated features we call as non motor features like depression sexual dysfunction cognitive dysfunctions speech disturbances visual disturbances etc so rigidity resting tremor alkinesia and postural instability with secondary we call a non motor dysfunction like cognitive dysfunction ocular dysfunction oropharyngeal dysfunctions mask like face musculoskeletal deformities pain and sensory symptoms autonomic dysfunctions dermatological problems etc there are a lot of other things also we already mentioned this it is described as a hypokinetic hypertonic syndrome unilateral and effective with levodopa in the initial state there is absence of postural instability absence of autonomic symptoms cognitive disturbances in early stage in a late stage they are affected so over a period of time you will see that as the time passes non motor symptoms becomes more and fluctuation dyskinesia and falls also becomes more and more and there will be dementia and psychological disturbances will be more and you will see that the person will slowly deteriorate these are different types of motor symptoms and non motor symptoms motor symptoms we have already described bradycardia speech disturbances postural instability tremors gait disturbances and hypertonia while among non motor behavior problems mental disturbances sense of smell may be affected sweating may be affected gastrointestinal like constipation etc and person might have painful symptoms so by and large the classical symptoms in parkinsonism will be all group of symptoms like slow movement bradykinesia or alkinesia typical gait slow shuffling gait cogwheel rigidity mask like face resting tremors slow reaction time and frequent falls these are all the groups of symptoms will label them as parkinsonism where person do not respond to levodopa so these are parkinson's disease and these are the symptoms of parkinson's disease central symptoms lung symptoms muscular symptoms intestinal symptoms eye mouth skin and systemic we have already mentioned majority of the them at your leisure time you can go through you can have a pause and you can go through we already mentioned this tremors rigidity alkinesia and postural instability as far as tremor is concerned they are typically described as pill rolling tremors they always start unilateral later on it becomes bilateral and earliest finding you will get in a upper limb then it will spread to head you will start getting movement of head face jaw and later on also in legs they are classical resting tremors or we call static tremors they disappears with movements of the part of the body which is we call purposeful movements such as picking up objects and they are also diminished during sleep so while 
buttoning etc the tremors will be less while picking up glass it will be less while doing some purposeful movement it will be less but at rest the tremor will increase that's why they are called static tremor or resting tremors and they also become less during sleep so tremors are described as a resting static or non intentional tremor they are slow coarse and compounding type usually in one hand they are pill rolling rhythmic and they are maximum at rest and may be temporarily suppressed by movements particularly while picking up objects etc rigidity is very peculiar we call is a cogwheel rigidity which you can demonstrate at elbow also at wrist it is being described as lead pipe type of rigidity or cogwheel rigidity cogwheel rigidity is more common with parkinsonian and complicated by parkinsonian tremors it is asymmetric in early stage and can be demonstrated at wrist and can be demonstrated at elbow also so can be easily demonstrable at that two area while in a gait you can have a off and on state means suddenly person can freeze and person will not be able to walk this is called off and on state during movements particularly in a gait and gait is very peculiarly described as a short shuffling gait among akinesia bradykinesia or hypokinesia the word utilized bradykinesia is the most important symptoms which produces maximum disability bradykinesia is a slowness of a voluntary movement akinesia is an extension of a bradykinesia where there is nearly absence of voluntary movement and it will be a very early sign where person might have in a gait or you can see over the face also where there is a reduced frequency of blinking which is that's the reason why it is good number of time described as mask like face there is also one term which is very frequently being utilized is hypomimia so face lacks the expression mobility that's why it is also called as a mask like face or hypomimia there will be drooling of saliva infrequently there will be blinking the blinking is reduced and the voice is a soft voice monotonous speech this is very peculiar in case of parkinson's disease so mask like face greasy skin monotonous speech glabbered tap will be positive that is also given a name myerson signs flex posture impaired postural reflexes etc are the classical features in parkinson's disease when he when you ask the person to write down there will be typical micrographia once the person develop parkinson disease you will see the letters are very small and this is described as a micrographia when he tries to maintain the erect posture he can have postural instability and gait disturbances this will be not very common in an early stage but as the disease advances this findings will be very classically seen so it is rare in a early stage of parkinson disease will starts about 5 years after the onset of the disease in a early stage there is typical posture called flex posture head is flex forward neck will be bent trunk will be also bent and he will slightly lean towards one side and during a gait asymmetrically reduce arm swing slowing of the gait and early fatigue shorten strides of the length intermittent shuffling tripling over the object with sometime ankle dystonia and inability to turn quickly and as the disease advances now person will have a very short shuffling gait or it is called fascinating gait 
and there is a, always a fear of falling and person will not be able to stop and initiate the movement so there is a good amount of postural instability very very frequently seen in standing posture or while walking so person will find to initiate also there will be difficulty and as the disease advances there is a very high chance of frequent falls postural instability rigidity and stoop forward and later on person is almost bedridden so difficulty in initiation of walking short steps reduce arm swing and short shuffling small steps running up to the center of gravity described and sometime you can get freezing phenomena that is slow to start walking short steps rapid small step tendency to turn and block reduce arm swing and impaired balance on turning and person can have frequent falls very very common so this is a typical slide which is very commonly seen head bent forward tremors of the head mask like face drooling rigidity stoop posture weight loss or kinesia tremors loss of postural reflex bone demineralization and propulsive gait these are very very typical findings and glabellar tap primary motor symptoms secondary motor symptoms and non motor symptoms we'll be discussing those so cardinal we have already described trap that is tremor rigidity or kinesia and postural instability other motor symptoms like micrographia mask like face or hypomemia reduce eye blinking soft voice or monotonous speech dysphagia and freezing while among non motor tone non motor symptoms anosmia that is smell disturbances sensory disturbances mood disturbances like depression sleep disturbances like insomnia autonomic disturbances person can have bladder and bowel function disorders orthostatic hypotension gi tract disturbances in the form of constipation genito urinary disturbances sexual disturbances cognitive impairment and person can even develop dementia these are all the different features we can just have these are the motor symptoms and these are non motor symptoms this complies entire picture of parkinson disease but this feature will develop as the disease advances they are not seen in a early stage so non motor symptoms are lot of non motor symptoms like gi disorders autonomic dysfunction sensory disorder neuropsychiatric disorder urological orthostatic hypotension sleep disturbances etc there are lot of non motor symptoms so dystonia is a motor symptoms which can occur micrographia is another motor symptoms mask like face is a motor symptom sexual dysfunction is a non motor symptoms akathisia akathisia is a movement disorder characterized by feeling of inner restlessness and inability to stay still that is described as a akathisia means person can't stay steady he will be restless and inability to stay still constantly there will be movements which will be occurring person can complain of cramping reduced swallowing that will be part of a motor movement drooling of saliva will be another symptom short shuffling gait is a classical symptom short shuffling gait speech disturbances particularly monotonous speech stop posture as far as the stages is concerned they are divided into five stages stage 0 no signs stage 1 unilateral disease they say between stage 2 and 1 unilateral disease with axial involvement then it is called 1.5 stage 2 is bilateral without impaired balance 
and when it is bilateral with impaired balance it is called 2.5 stage 3 is mild to moderate bilateral disease with postural instability and physical dependent means now he starts requiring what we call is a walker or a stick and stage 4 severe disability where person will require some assistant or a wheelchair and lastly stage 5 is called wheelchair bound or bedridden these are the five different stages which are being described and here you can see that is description stage 1 unilateral involvement only with minimal or no functional impairment stage 2 bilateral without balance impairment stage 3 with impairment of balance stage 4 will require now some support like walker and stage 5 is wheelchair or bedridden so these are the five different stages which are being described this is a worst stage and usually person do not recover from this stage atypical parkinsonism is called parkinson disease mimics and parkinson disease plus when to suspect atypical when motor symptoms are odd like early fall cerebellar signs pyramidal signs and axial rigidity you must suspect atypical parkinsonism or vertical gaze palsy and there is a slow saccades early dementia hallucinations and person if he is having orthostatic hypotension incontinence impotency you should suspect atypical parkinsonism where response to levodopa may be seen and there is a rapid progression of the disease and you can detect by mri or pet scan that there is a degeneration of basal ganglia also it is called abcde that is autonomic dysfunction bladder and bowel involvement cerebellar signs dementia eye signs and frequent falls then also you should suspect atypical parkinsonism so atypical parkinsonism can have a motor symptoms oculomotor symptoms cognitive symptoms and autonomic symptoms so if you get any one of this it will be in favor of atypical parkinson parkinsonian disorders i am not going into detail we already mentioned so you can have two groups this is a differential diagnosis of symmetrical axial psp cbd msa and dlb these are some of the psp is progressive supranuclear palsy cbd is a corticobulbar degeneration msa msa is multiple system atrophy and dlb is dementia with levy body it is if you are interested you can go through same thing progressive supranuclear palsy corticobulbar degeneration multisystemic atrophy and dementia with levy body these are all we put them into parkinsonism plus syndrome groups as far as investigation is concerned the best is a clinical method so neurological examination oculomotor examination eeg and spec scan spec scan will demonstrate the degeneration of those neurons so best is neurological examination which will give you almost majority of time the idea and you can confirm by eeg and spec scan which will give you the best idea regarding a neuronal degeneration and try to rule out those conditions so ct scan may give you a rough idea but pet scan will be the best we call spec scan that will give you the best idea regarding a degenerative areas you can see that here this area is decreasing so there is a neuro degeneration so there's are the best way of making a diagnosis normal here you can see that there is a degeneration among differential diagnosis we already mentioned you should differentiate classical parkinson disease from parkinsonian disorders and from parkinsonism plus syndrome 
as well as atypical variety. Those you should try to differentiate. As far as management is concerned, first exercise and nutrition we call is a non-pharmacological treatment. Among pharmacological treatment, mainly for symptomatic and for protective purpose. And if those doesn't work, then surgical intervention like deep brain stimulation. There is a trial which are going on for fetal nigral transplantation and globus pallidus, pallidotomy. These are all the different ways and means of treatment in case of Parkinson's disease. So first goal is maintenance of function and having a good quality of life and avoiding drug induced complications. So you want to reduce bradykinesia, tremors, rigidity and abnormal posture. And we want to also improve cognitive functions. We want to improve the imbalance and also person should have a good quality of life. So there is a non-pharmacological treatment which are very frequently that is physiotherapy, exercise, speech therapy and occupational therapy. Also it includes psychotherapy also. So those are one of the best in non-pharmacological treatment. So non-pharmacological treatment followed by a pharmacological treatment where you do dopamine replacement treatment and neuroprotective agents. If not working, you go for a surgical intervention like deep brain stimulations and newer neural tissue transplants, etc. So among surgical stereotactic surgery for thalamus and palladium that is called thalamectomy and pallidotomy. Deep brain stimulus for again thalamus and for palladium and transplantation of uh, embryonic cells are being tried. This is a deep brain stimulation. You can go for ablation or deep brain stimulation. This is a deep brain stimulation done for thalamus or palladium. These are all the different clinical features and depending upon those clinical features, you can go for drug therapy, rehabilitations, etc. and symptomatic treatment. So depending upon the disability, what treatment you can advise has been mentioned here. That is say gait instability, you can go for physiotherapy, for dysphagia, speech therapy, then dysarthria again speech therapy, then for eye problems, artificial tears, you can use that visual disturbances, then you can use glasses, dystonia, you can use botulism toxins, myoclonus, clonazepam, paracetam, sodium valproate, orthostatic hypotension by stockings, high salt diet, fludrocortisones, etc. Hyperreflexia, oxybutyrin, butenin, depression, antidepression drugs, emotional incontinence, amitriptyline, drooling, you can use anticholinergic drugs, etc. These are all supportive treatments. All supportive treatments. I am not mentioning, I will be mentioning only two words. Levodopa and Carbidopa combination is the most common for dopamine agonist. So they will increase the level of dopamine and that will also improve tremors as well as rigidity. So this is the most common drug which is being utilized. I am not going into pharmacology regarding levodopa, carbidopa groups, when to use. These are all the algorithm charts. At your leisure time, you can go through. These are different findings you will come across when you are giving the management like wearing off, off period, on off period, drug failure and peak dose, all those period you will come across. Then prolonging the dose of levodopa, etc. There are a lot of things which are there. I am not going into that. There are dopaminergic drugs, there are dopamine 
receptor agonist and there are peripheral dopamine decarbolic sales inhibitors so you get combination of dopaminergic drug levodopa with carbidopa these are the two common drugs which are being combined together there are other drugs also we'll call dopamine receptor agonist so i'm not going into detail regarding there they are comt inhibitors mao b inhibitors anticholinergic drugs all these drugs depends and these are the doses and recommended usual doses and recommended dosing schedules these are the treatment medication anticholinergic drugs comt dopamine agonist dopamine decarboxylase then inhibitors mao inhibitors and nmda antagonist etc so these are all the different drugs groups at your leisure time you can go through among complications because of drug itself recurrent uti frequent falls injuries and fractures dementia is one of the most important symptom which can produce deb debility person can be become bedridden once he reaches to a stage 4 and 5 and there is a very high chance of secondary infections like respiratory tract infection urinary tract infections are most common in those stage 4 and 5 so these are the common complications so i end my lecture here i hope you will find this lecture helpful to you very frequently ask in your theory as a full question very frequently you can come across in your everyday practice very very common good number of time in our family itself so if you understand this particular part you will be able to pick up those in a very early stage and if you treat them they will have a better quality of life it is not reversible it is not curable but at least you can reduce the symptoms and signs and person will have a better quality of life if you like this particular lecture don't forget to press button like subscribe and you can share with your friends and you can give your suggestions so that i can improve in my quality thank you very much for taking out time i know that your time is valuable and i appreciate you have spent some of the time with me see you in next lecture